your screen. And we'll try to get as many of those answered toward the end of the program. But we apologize in advance if we don't have the time to address your question. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's guests. Koa Beck is the former editor-in-chief of Jezebel. Previously, she was the executive editor at Vogue and the co-host of the hashtag MeToo Memos on WNYC's The Takeaway. Her writing has appeared in The Atlantic, The New York Observer, The Guardian, and among others. For her reporting prowess, she has been interviewed and has appeared on many panels about gender and identity at the Harvard Kennedy School at Harvard University and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, just to name a few. She will be in conversation with Ruby Hamad, who's a journalist, author, and academic completing a PhD in media studies at UNSW Australia. Her Guardian article, How White Women Use Strategic Tears to Silence Women of Color, became a global flashpoint for discussions of white feminism and racism and inspired her debut book, White Tears, Brown Scars. Our moderator tonight is Melissa Guerra Grant, who is a staff writer covering justice at the New Republic. She is the author of Playing the Whore, the work of sex work. Her feature reporting has been published by BuzzFeed News and The Guardian. And her commentary and criticism has appeared in the Washington Post, the New York Times, Book Forum, and the New York Review of Books. I'd like to welcome our guest. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. Hello. Thank you, everyone, for joining us in a very uh, hectic week. And we are going to have a conversation that I think actually is incredibly timely um, for the moment that we find ourselves in. I'm so thankful to have um, Ko and Ruby to help talk us through some of these things. Um, and also get to get celebrate their work. Uh, it's a tough time to, to put a book out into the world. And I was saying to Koa beforehand, I feel like this will be a good roadmap for us to start to think what's on the other side of this, you know, like, where are we going to be going? How could the world look different? Um, what status quo do we not want to move back to after the Trump era? I thought that we would start by just kind of defining our terms. It seems sort of a given now that white feminism is like floating out there as a construct, but I think it, it helps to just get very clear honing in on what we mean. And so Koa, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you identify white feminism, the hallmarks of it that help us begin to describe it and understand it. Sure, I also just wanna say thank you to everyone for coming and especially Melissa for taking time out of her busy reporting schedule to do this and to Beth and Morgan for coordinating all these logistics. This is a lot of work for people so that you can sit here and have this discussion. So thank you to them. Um, I define white feminism in my book as a very specific ideology towards achieving gender equality that is built on tenets of white supremacy supremacy, um, individual accumulation of wealth, um, usually corporate ascension or some variation of that, and a lot of other fun pieces of capitalism. Um, mm -hmm. It can be practiced to my assessment by really anyone of any racial background or um, gender affiliation, but I was very intentional in uh, designating the parameters of white feminism in that what connects, say, you know, the conversation we're having now with what middle to upper class white American suffragettes were talking about is that there is an aspiration to whiteness in this mm -hmm. ideology, and that's what's being exported. And that, as you sort of set it up in the introduction to your book, I feel like you're, you're describing sort of an encounter with white feminism that allows you to see some of the shapes of that. In that moment, I think it's... Um, a, sort of office stories about working inside of women's media, trying to get stories placed that you wanted. Is there anything just from that, those encounters or maybe a previous encounter that that made it very clear to you like, okay, this is what I'm, this, this is something that I'm dealing with right now. There's like a shape to this and a definition to this. Like this isn't just my individual experience. This is a phenomenon. This is like a structural thing called white feminism. Well, I feel like, um, 
to your point, like white feminism is something that uh, because of my career and my reporting on gender, I feel like I have, unfortunately, a lot of fluency in <laughs> because in a lot of quote unquote feminist spaces that I have navigated and either like, you know, been present at in terms of like a speaker or even, you know, attending and covering um, white feminism is always in the room, and I'm very aware of it when it speaks, when the ide ideology quickly shifts, you know, towards a lot of those talking points, and I'm very sensitive to it, but I also think that for a large part of my career specifically, I took my own navigation of white feminism for granted. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought of it mostly as like a professional skill set, you know, that I had and that I was very aware of in like meetings. Um, but I think that in terms of actual moments, um, what Melissa is getting to is that in the introduction, I lay out a story where a mainstream women's um, publication that I worked for. Um, Nicki Minaj was on the cover and it was a beautiful cover. Um, the, the profile was done by Janet Mock. It was a great story. And I have a memory of picking the cover up and looking at it and, you know, Nikki looked gorgeous. She had like incredibly beautiful makeup, all the top styling. And another editor behind me who worked at the same publication I did looked at it also complimented the cover and said, um, I love when they make trashy people look good. And I just never recovered from that statement <laughs> um, for, for a lot of reasons. But I feel like, especially as a younger woman, it seared into me this idea that, you know, no matter how women like Nicki Minaj, women like me, people who don't even identify as women, people who are not even seen as like the women in the women's rights, you know, dialogue mm -hmm. that we're often talking about, no matter how we sort of presented or whatever respectability politics we trafficked in to be like seen in these spaces, there was always going to be somebody like my colleague at the time who was going to make a comment like that, that was reflective of um, either our culture, you know, our racial background, our class, our sexual orientation, our gender orientation. Um, but also, I think most importantly, our strategic goals as marginalized genders, which aren't necessarily to run a company, you know, or to mm -hmm. find a long term partner to like have a baby with or to like get out of student loan debt, like, for a lot of women and non binary people in this country and elsewhere in the world, um, women's rights are about basic needs. Mm -hmm. And white feminism has never been uh, concerned with that. I want to take it to you, Ruby, to talk about mm -hmm. kind of the why, why do we have this, the structural phenomenon of white feminism? Um, whose interest does it serve? And how is it constructed? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, obviously, Co has done a, a great job of really given that really robust um, definition. And it does, you know, she also explains why, because they're a, a after their own interests, and it, it is a capitalist and neoliberalist um, ideology. Uh, so, you know, when I I came, you know, I have a, you know, I, I'm very much into discourse. So I have a, a discourse background. I try to, I, I'm really fascinated by how um, people, things are represented, um, you know, the ways in which, um, you know, repetitive images and words about certain groups, certain people, uh, how they come, you know, through, you know, centres of, 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 of repetition, they, they just come to be seen as, the way things are, you know, and so it, when I, you know, I wrote my book, I, I mean, very much it is about white feminism, but it, it's because that's how I came into into it. Um, but it's also it's it's the widest um, dynamic um, in in Western society between white women and other women, and as um, you know, Koa said, uh, people who don't identify as women, you know, uh, uh, other genders as well, and. Um, so this, you know, this, uh, you know, and I want to be very careful to say that this, uh, I don't mean to say all women of colour or all non-white women are treated the same and represented the same and, and, and have the same experiences in this system, only to say that there is a gulf that exists between uh, white women that some women from other backgrounds can, as Koa said as well, aspire to and in some cases reach. And so I wanted to go back and be, and think, of how did this start? Where did this start? And and you know, in my research, I, it goes back to the beginnings of colonialism. You know, when Europe colonized the Americas and then Australia and then the rest, you know, almost the entire world. 
and part of that was the um, uh, the this gulf, this this deliberate separation between European women and the women that were being colonized. Mm-hmm. And so there was this elevation, which was also subordinating because it was an elevation based of white women based on, you know, uh, concepts of virtue and innocence and, and, and being in need of protection from the colonized. And as part of that, non-white women were considered deficient in womanhood. So they were essentially not women. They were too sexualized. They were too promiscuous. They were, they were not pure, etc. cetera. Um, and so that gulf hasn't been addressed and it hasn't been bridged. And so uh, a feminism in the West that is led by white women, by middle-class white women, is always going to inherit that colonial ideology of superiority because yeah, from the beginning, they were agitating for their own, um, sorry, to improve their own um, status. And that didn't include, not only did it not include others, it, it, it deliberately um, exploited and added to the oppression. So, so examples that I give is, you know, the removal of Indigenous children that um, from their families, that white women had a very strong role to play in, both in North America and in the Australian continent. And slavery, you know, so um, white women, and including suffragists, not only neglected other women and non-binary people, they deliberately uh, exploited and used the oppression of other women to leverage their own status by appealing to white men and saying, "We will continue, you know, the the, the domination of the of, of of the superior white race if you allow us to." Uh, paraphrasing obviously to 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 join you in power and that is what we still see mm-hmm. um and of course capitalism has always been a a hallmark of colonialism um you know the the the, the resource theft the slavery so it's no surprise that a, a, a movement a white feminist movement that inherits that mentality of of profit of domination and superiority is going to be functioning the way it does today and it, it sort of functions also i think whether or not it acknowledges this explicitly on exclusion, right? Like there's a certain kind of womanhood that we're moving to, but we're going to not acknowledge that this is a certain kind of womanhood. We're just going to say, this is what all women want. You know, these are the issues that are women's rights issues. I particularly liked in your book, Cohen, you know, sort of, you, you gave words to experience that I've had, which is like, as also somebody who's, you know, pitched women's magazines and done work sort of in, that space, even in the kind of international women's rights spaces, the the dissonance between sort of the very American, very commercial, like it's about abortion, maybe, but it's really about children and husbands and sharing the housework. And that's it. That that's that's the circle, which is more or less like the angel of the house, right? It's just the husband is also in the house mm-hmm. now too and doing mm-hmm. some work. And mm-hmm. and then I, I contrast that with the experiences I've had sort of in an international women's rights context where you know, it's not always the case. There's certainly a white feminism that operates in that world too. You know, I'm thinking of things like, you know, the the sort of UN women sort of like large NGO complex where like women's mm-hmm. rights is also very narrowly defined sometimes. But then you also have just incredible grassroots collective work where the definition of what women's rights would mean is just so much more expansive. Um, and it, it, I feel like this is this is like really the question for me is, when we're talking about exclusion and what's sort of like outside the purview of white feminism, we're, we're not shining a light on that to say like, wouldn't it be nice if we included everyone else, right? We're, we're pointing this to, to say, this was a structural choice mm-hmm. to frame the concerns of women's rights in this way. But also when you exclude all of that, you will fail. You are not actually doing the work. Um, and I'm thinking of a conversation I had last week I can't believe that was just last week with organizers in Georgia, um, black women reproductive justice organizers who were saying like, this is how we make our pitch to get out the vote, right? We lead with reproductive justice. We don't believe that this is like too divisive. Um, and in fact, it's bringing our whole lives into the conversation. And that we're not just doing that because it's nice to not comp- compartmentalize ourselves because that's how you actually reach people. And it worked. Right. So I, I want to ask you a little bit about that, like these exclusions that you see, maybe even going back to the suffragists, how we sort of got to this moment. 
Um, and, and what we lose because of that, you know, why it still feels like we're so set far back, um, why this feels like, you know, as much as sort of a pop feminism may be achieved, that that might be about the limits of it. Well, to your point, I mean, so many feminist branded or, you know, feminist quote unquote spaces that I've moved in, the conversation inevitably, and I would argue somewhat obtusely, will end somewhere along the lines of like, how do we be inclusive? And it's like this very like doe-eyed kind of like inquiry. And the way that I've at least understood, you know, white feminism's interpretation of this, um, you know, whether it's now or, you know, 1920 in the United States is through this very like ornamental methodology, you know? So it's like these panels I go on where there's like, you know, one black woman <laughs> um, or, you know, uh, a, a methodology that started to grow like a little after I got out of college was there'd be like one trans person, you know, and, and a bunch of like cis women who were white and from like middle class homes and all have college degrees. And it, and it always white feminism as I've come to research it and report on it always kind of functions that way. And that at the, the core of the practice and the ideology are issues that only center women from those more economic, secure, usually white, usually straight backgrounds. And so from that vantage point, when you go into gender analysis or understandings of gender equality from a white feminist lens, that's how you get to those spaces where all of a sudden you turn around and it's like, oh, we need a black woman to be on this panel um, to inoculate us against accusations of racism. If you had started with discussions of uh, food security, affordable housing, immigration reform, um, basic survival, you would have a quote unquote diverse panel. <laughs> um, but white feminism of, you know, now and your um, has always been concerned with, with more or less mimicking what husbands, sons, fathers, and brothers have, and seeing that cleanly as the template for feminist equality, but also feminist ascension. And one of the arcs that I document in my book is how for a good cultural moment there, around the time that the vote was won for women in the United States, um, some of these more affluent suffragettes did start to work with more like immigrant women, uh, women who worked in laundries. They're referred to by historians as industrial feminists. Um, they were the women who, you know, advocated to have their work days shortened. They advocated to have higher wages. They advocated to have like break times. Um, their feminism was really rooted in understanding and also checking a lot of like corporate industrial power that used them as basically replaceable uh cogs, you know, in a machine to sort of like make profit and money. And for a, li a little moment there, they were working together. But that union more or less fell apart because of white feminism's values and that if they wanted to cleanly, you know, have what their husbands had, have what their sons had, a lot of these immigrant women and working class women and talking with them were like, you do realize that like, if you want to be, you know, the 1920s version of like your husband, if you want to own companies, if you want to be the head of a household, if you want to have all this luxury time, you will be exploiting me through poor wages, through poor working conditions, through like a structure that basically says that my work is of little to no value. And for basically four waves, white feminism has said that that's okay. Oh, Melissa, mute. Thank you. I muted for a second. I said, that's probably for the best. You're, you're reminding me of the, <laughs> the, the absolute just incomprehension that I met from, from some feminists in the media when I suggested that, you know, a book like Lean In, for example, was largely possible because Sheryl Sandberg could outsource her domestic and childcare mm -hmm. labor to other women for whom the question of leaning in was not perhaps the most relevant question in their lives, particularly because she was their boss. So, yeah. you know, what was that going to look like? And, and there was, I think after that, sort of this like little crest of in interest in things like wages for housework, sort of like recovering some of the earlier waves of feminisms, focus on labor, like bringing a more materialist or class lens to understanding what women's issues were. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that got sort of swept aside in the Trump moment. I don't think entirely. Um, 
but it's certainly not in the consciousness in the way that I remember it was in those sort of years leading up to essentially when Hillary Clinton lost. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I feel like that, you know, we're in this moment now where I think there's gonna be a great desire to kind of like, not just with the pandemic return to normal, but also like return our gender politics to normal, right? Whatever normal was on November 8th, 2016, mm -hmm. uh, which seems like a huge mistake. Um, <laughs> and I, I leave that to both of you and just sort of like what, you know, that was already a fairly exclusive lens on feminism. Um, what possibilities do we have to, to do something different? And, and can it be done within this sort of, you know, white feminist industrial complex? Do we have to dismantle that and divest from it? What is it going to take? Well, what, one of the things that I am kind of cautiously optimistic about, um, I wrote an op-ed in Time about it um, very recently, is that with COVID specifically, um, so many institutions in this country are crumbling and don't work um, for really a, a lot of people. And for a lot of these middle to upper class homes, you know, that, that are built on the type of um, outsourcing of domestic labor that you just referenced, um, there have been, you know, this, this spate of like all these, you know, trend pieces um, in the Times and Washington Post elsewhere, where it's like, you know, all these middle class white collar women are like burned out, you know, and, and they, they have, um, I quote in my book, they have like five jobs, you know, and, and they do, I mean, in terms of like, children who effectively need to be homeschooled now and then like all the domestic work and then the labor outside the home that they are still tasked with and i view that um, as a systemic failure um and for a lot of these women who are quoted and who are reporting this my interpretation especially when it gets towards like you know kind of more lean in-esque like talking points or narratives of like their own success you know, they're kind of surprised, right, that like white feminism isn't like swooping in to save them mm -hmm. from this dilemma that's happening. Whereas, you know, where I sit, especially from the book, with the cultural mm -hmm. vantage point that I have, but also the historical research is that white feminism was never designed to save you. It was never designed to optimize any of these systems in which you have been working in as a parent, as a mother, as a wife, as a white collar worker. Um, and that is a, a white feminist failure, I would say. Whereas many other um, feminist and gendered movements led by women of color, immigrant women, working class women have been working towards paid, you know, federal parental leave, have been working towards subsidized childcare, have been putting pressure on our government for years to have these sorts of resources. So I'm hoping <laughs> that um, for a number of, you know, lean in, influence dusted, you know, homes in this country, this systemic failure has been a huge jolt to them, you know, specifically in their household, but also in the way that they think about work in the first place. Because I think that's one of the things that um, white feminism and then like just our economic models have been very successful at in, in the United States is just invisibilizing like all the work of the home, you know, whether it's like a, you know, stay at home mother who does it or a domestic worker. Um, a lot of our economic models just do not factor any of that work in at all into living, but also just just like do not fit within what we think of as like money or currency as well. Mm -hmm. So I am hoping that, you know, once we clear whatever this dysfunctional messy hurdle of vaccine distribution is going to be, and there's already a lot of reporting out there that's like very concerning about, you know, who's going to get this, who isn't, who's going to pay for it. Like these are, especially in the United States, this is, the manifestation of a lot of our systemic failures, healthcare being one of them, where it's like, even if there is a vaccine, how will we make sure that a number of people in this country, especially essential workers, many of whom are women of color, can actually get it and won't be hit with like a thousand dollar medical bill, you know, in a week. Um, so I am hoping that this pandemic will reframe how a lot of people have experienced the last year and experienced labor and work um, and that these when some of these institutions do reopen and some of us do go back into them a number of us expect different things from them um, mm -hmm. whether it's like our government or you know our big company in terms of um, wages and health care but also like leave um, and just like what the individual worker is responsible for as well um, I'm I'm hoping mm -hmm. I thought of something as you were saying that so now I'm going to throw kind of two questions at once to you Ruby okay um, you know this 
last year, in addition to serving marked by the pandemic, I feel like we had the summer of white women's tears. Whether, you know, all of these videos, whether the, the video of the confrontation in Central Park where a white woman lied um, about um, a bird watcher, a black man accosting her, which absolutely didn't happen. And then there were some other, you know, smaller incidences as well. But for me, these will always be sort of twinned. It's like, this, did the scales truly fall from people's eyes? It's like, this is what weaponized white women's pain and, and, and this using sort of protection as a, as a bargaining chip to have some power over someone looks like, um, you know, do those representations make a difference? Like, I normally don't believe that that works, but there's, there was something very, I don't know, it just, it, it felt like that, that, that may have opened up that conversation in a different way and put it in people's faces in a different way. Um, so I'm wondering what you think about that and what might come from that. Yeah, look, I think that that definitely um, ha it, it, it does have potential to be a, a, a significant turning point, um, you know, if, even in long term history, because it showed, um, well, exactly what I talk about, like, you know, people, you, you know, the, the, the term white tears, it, it's kind of like white feminism, it can, it can be used in many different ways. The way I use it is that it's an, it's an understanding of the um, that uh, white women understand that they have a certain power over non-white uh, people and that this power is actually rooted not in dominating them um, overtly, but in this sort of surreptitious um, display of victimhood. And so what was fascinating about that incident in the, you know, the park uh, is, is that the woman, when she said to him, you know, when she said to the black man, I will call the police and tell them an African-American man is threatening me. So she knows what that means. That, that she knows that they are both aware of what that means. And, and, and so that, that was like the ultimate threat of you do what I say or I'm going to play the victim so that other men can come in and save me from you. And that really is what I would, you know, what I talk about in my book is, is the foundation of, 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 or part of the foundation of the societies that started, you know, the Western societies that started as European colonies, um, is that the, the white women were presented as, as, you know, these, these helpless damsels that had to be protected. And it was through that, that violence, again, you know, the, the taking of land, the taking of children, the dispossession, the murders, the wars, and, and uh, it, it was all justified through that. And so that is, you know, the, the, the power of, of that. But it's a power that is also inherently um, subordinating because it's always, um, it's always acknowledging, uh, you know, even to white women that there is always going to be someone above them because in order to be sort of assert your, her, your dominance through victimhood over the people below you, there has to be someone above you that's going to come along mm -hmm. and perform that act of violence on your behalf. So it's, it's essentially ensuring that these, these sort of these, these racial hierarchies stay in place. And so what I was interested in is how that manifests in, in you know, between women and in, in, in particular between white feminists and non-white feminists, because, you know, like, like how I came in through the media, the media in Australia, and I spent a lot of time, um, you know, many years vainly you know attempting to ask for more inclusion and just you know at some point you, you just sit and you think how many more articles do black and brown women have to write about the whiteness of tv the whiteness of feminist media the whiteness you know whitewashing and black but how many more because we write them they go viral everyone promises to do better <laughs> and then it all resets so that really indicates to me there's a there's a, there's a there's a fundamental um, uh, you know this is this is a fundamental societal systemic basis for it and B uh, and this was perhaps for me the most devastating is that it's not just a matter of they're not hearing or understanding they hear they understand and then they pretend not to and they, they turn it off and that that was the hardest thing so um, you know, in, in terms of, of, of what the hope is, you know, it, it's, there really has to, and this is a hard thing to ask of people, there, there, there has to be uh, hard because it goes against our nature because we all want to see ourselves as good, right? But why, why society has to really acknowledge that 
violence um, that has been committed and is still being committed. And not just as something that other white people do and all oh, that was just in the past, but, but how it still plays out today. And there's a relinquishing of power that has to have, uh, that has to occur. And, and you know, that, that, that again, something that Kawa tackles is that there's a, with, with white feminism, it's, a, it's a wanting more without giving up anything. Mm-hmm. But you can't have a woman's liberation without the, the women who have more than others being willing to relinquish some of that for, you know, so that everybody can have some benefits. So, you know, it's, a, it's a, I wanted to believe that as, you know, like, like how are I, you know, I, I am hopeful. And, and there was just such a massive um, outpouring, you know, in the summer, in the Northern summer. Mm. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's hard work, you know, it's, it's not going to be just, okay, let's just have a, uh, 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 make sure there's a black woman on the panel, a trans woman, a disabled. As much as, of course, we need that representation, but if it's, as Kawa said, if it's coming, if it's coming as an add-on and not from that basis, uh, because if you, you know, if you cared about not, uh, you know, uh, characterizing sort of minstrelly type uh, caricatures on, on, on TV and your TV shows, of course you're going to have black people and brown people, mm-hmm. right? You don't just write the show or write the, the movie and then get someone to come in and be like, okay, can you just like, you know, go over this or, or, or just, you know, if we have a black person in it as well or, or an Arab person, then, then that makes it all okay. If you enter into it um, with that, that sort of inclusion at, at the basis of, uh, then you're automatically going to get a, you know, a better product, a product that isn't um, exclusionary, that isn't offensive and, and so on. So, uh, and at the moment, you know, white feminism is still very much, um, we'll, we want to be exactly as we are, but, you know, let's just, you know, what, what, what can we do to gloss it over and give it a better sheen? I feel like that was part of the, the kind of reckoning, the, the media in particular is reckoning um, after the, the killings of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd this summer were these sort of promises to do better and promises to, you know, we hear you, we feel your pain. Um, Well, let's check back in in a year, right? And and see if things are any different. You know, I don't know if it's too early to say that, you know, for example, the Vogue cover with Kamala Harris that's getting talked about a lot right now, if that is an indicator that things haven't changed all that very much with an incredibly powerful woman even being treated this way. Um, I don't know, like I also the whole kind of representations of Kamala Harris is a whole other thing, uh, which I'm super interested in. I'm curious sort of how that's gonna be a part of this um, going forward. You know, like there's a way that, you know, I'm thinking of somebody like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, for example, like she wasn't necessarily understood by like the white feminist world as like a, a woman in politics who was running to represent us in quite the same way um, until she actually won. Right. And now there's this sort of like obsession with the squad and like the squad is here for us. But it's like, well, where have you been though? Right. Like it's, some of it feels very <laughs> tokenizing. And and also, I don't know, it just it sort of speaks in a in a strange way to the resilience of white feminism and the resilience of this sort of like white protectionism where white women's needs, bodies, interests, uh, perceived uh, victimhood is always at the front and will sort of like wrap itself in a containment way around what encounters. Um, and, and what that says to me is like, this has to be about a surrendering of power. Mm-hmm. You know, this has to be about, for example, looking at what happened last week at the Capitol and saying, this wasn't about um, racist white men, right? There were women at the front, there, there, the women died, right? The two, we have the woman who died actually involved in the most sort of directly insurrectionary activity of trying to get into the speaker's chamber or the speaker's lobby um, was a woman. And, you know, there's, I don't know, um, I, I don't know that we have the tools to sort of pull that apart. I think there's this desire to just sort of like valorize all women and whatever women do in this sort of fake way. And so also anything a woman do can't be bad, right? Women can't abuse one another. Women can't exploit one another at work. Um, that, that doesn't happen. And so I feel like that is maybe the reckoning that needs to happen to understand that like we are locked actually in struggle with each other. This isn't just about struggling against white men. This isn't just about struggling against, um, you know, the religious right, that, that we are in a struggle with one another. And I want to close with both of you on that. And then if people have questions, this would be a good chance to throw them into the, the Q&A chat and we will get to those shortly. I, I will say, Melissa, based on what you said, um, 
uh, a thread that I really pull out in my book and analyze, you know, really through a hundred years of um, women and non-binary history in, in this country is that white feminism is one very good at homogenizing the feminist experience. So much like you were saying about this sort of glossy sheen, like it's, you know, whether it's 1920 or 2020, it's very good at adapting with the times and adapting with rhetoric um, and being very insidious in its functionality. But um, on top of that, uh, white feminism is very good at optics and always has been. And um, I mean, there's a lot, you know, that can be said and that I do say about like Instagram, for instance, mm -hmm. and how white feminism works in the Instagram space. But more importantly, predating in Instagram, um, I include an anecdote about, um, for anyone who knows, audience Doris Stephen. She's a very prominent suffragette in the United States. She advocated for women's uh, right to vote. She protested outside the White House. And I include um, an anecdote in showing after the vote was won in the United States, she started partnering with Latin American feminists in other parts of the world. They were putting together kind of this global um, Pan-American sort of like feminist network. And they were doing like conferences and trying to get together an organization. And one of the things that Doris Stevens was very adept at is that in addition to basically deciding, you know, for a lot of these Latin American women, like what their feminism should look like and also what their goals should be in these other countries that she has spent no time in, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, is that she was very dedicated to in a grassroots budget um, to photographers mm -hmm. and getting lots and lots of pictures of herself under palm trees with all these, you know, different feminists from different parts of the world and getting these very kind of like, I mean, arguably like woke images of herself, you know, having these like deep political conversations with women from other parts of the world. And she was very adept at not only, you know, making sure that there was budget and money for those photos, but then making sure they got in newspapers all over the world, which was essentially the Instagram of her day. <laughs> so um, I think that white feminism, because it has always partnered with consumerism and power, um, its understanding of marketing and like language and appearances and like branding um, before, you know, we would even think of a word like that. Um, the suffragettes in this country were very attuned to branding. Um, one of an anecdote I go into into my book and and analyze, you know, against other historians accounts is that when uh, the vote was being organized for in this country, middle to upper class white suffragettes were very good at sitting down and basically designing in house who a suffragette was. Mm -hmm. um, and they wanted this particular image of a woman anytime somebody, you know, criticized the suffrage movement, anytime somebody mentioned suffrage, um, they wanted that image to be out there. And that image, which they designed in house was a very young woman who was able bodied, very thin, very fair skinned. Um, uh, aspired to be a wife, aspired to be a mother. Um, most of the images that I found, you know, while very similar, it's always like a woman who's either like aspiring to be middle class or is middle class and is like shielding a baby. Um, so suffrage and uh, those sorts of mechanics have always known what they were doing and they always know, much like Ruby said, like what they're trying to play to, especially in partnering with power, you know, whether that's um, powerful bodies in our government or like big corporations or, you know, big investments from like other powerful people. I think it's an enduring thread of white feminism. And I think that that has to be scrutinized as well, because um, many other gendered movements in this country that have been successful, you know, whether it's like legislation or getting behind a certain cause, do not do that. And actually, they're very skeptical of, of power and influence and money and build into their understanding of gendered movements a sort of scrutiny of either capitalism or also just, you know, marketing influence. And this is how we get things like the Goldman Sachs Women's Rights Breakfast or various bizarre press releases yeah. I've seen over the years. Right. Yeah. Um, Ruby, do you want to <laughs> close us out and then we'll do some Q&A? Yeah, um, and I really appreciate that question because it's really something that I've been thinking about, uh, particularly after finishing the book, is how much women and all women are fundamental to how power works and how power represents itself and others, but it's too unacknowledged still. So women, even though they were like 
you know, supposedly relegated to the private sphere, the domestic sphere, uh, you know, and Koa goes into this as well in her book. They've always worked. Mm -hmm. There's always been some powerful women that have partnered with powerful men. And, but it's deliberately kind of as much as possible kept out of the record books be, be, in favour mm. of this image of a, of a woman who is powerless, a woman who's always at home and, and a woman who doesn't have those, you know, supposedly, you know, masculine um, qualities of, of, or traits of, you know, of a, um, ambition, aggressiveness, um, uh, wanting power and uh, being able and willing to exploit um, others. And so we, we, uh, we struggle to, to really talk about that when it happens, because this is always this uh, sort of like this uh, all the societal wide um, need to like re put, you know, to, to, to re put the woman back in that, 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 that place of um, no, 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 women are more nurturing, women are more passive, women are more peaceful women. If we had more women, you know, in government in, uh, then we'd have a, we'd have a more compassionate government. We'd have more compassionate leadership. We'd have more compassionate, you know, parliaments, but that's not never been the case. You know, uh, when women have achieved power, they have not shown themselves on the whole to be any less um, uh, ruthless and, and in many ways and, and, and to scale back, um, uh, you know, a, a, a exploitation of other women or any other people. So I, I really do believe at the same time as we, we, we talk about the actual mechanics and machinations of how our society works is to really look at how much of, of of it is shaped by how we see each other, how we see women, how we see non-white people, black women, and uh, uh, that um, that that just like that just we're we're looking at the world through these glasses that we're often don't realize what we're wearing, and they color the world in a certain way. So when two people, and that's the really the basis of my book, two people can do the same thing, they can be regarded and perceived so differently, right? So a white woman and a, and a brown woman, you know, if you come in and, and halfway through their interaction and you don't know how it started, but they're both quite upset. And then, you know, the white woman starts crying. How many people are going to believe what the brown or the black woman side of the story? That history shapes what we're seeing. So that is what we, we have to, um, I really, you know, believe that, 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 um, images representations and words of, of, of how we, we we perceive the other um really um uh, deconstructing that is so vital as well to to rebuilding and and you know sort of taking down these these um these, these barriers and these these systems of oppression because it's 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 like it's material it's physical but it's things we can see and it's things that we 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 can't see that that um influence uh, uh, influence how we perceive the world and each other. Diving into some of the questions right now, they're all very thoughtful and some of them are very long. Thank you though, I appreciate the long <laughs> questions. Also, it just might take me a minute to kind of get through them. Um, yeah, this, this feels like kind of where we're at right now. So I'm gonna start with this one from an anonymous attendee. Um, with white supremacy on full display and for many people proudly so, how do you feel more nuanced ideas about white supremacy, such as white feminism, fit into a broader conversation about domination? Is it time for nuance? Why or why not? It's always time for nuance. It's mm -hmm. been time for nuance. <laughs> um, I would say uh, something that I spent a lot of time analyzing and thinking about when I sat down to write white feminism is specifically what that ideology has inherited from white supremacy and has not either checked or scrutinized or made any legislative or ideological efforts to distance themselves from. And one of the things that I thought about um, when I was watching, you know, in real time, like this footage of the Capitol and everything is that um, white supremacy, uh, women have always uh, had a very 
foundational and important role in spreading white supremacy. Um, there's a really amazing book out there that I highly recommend you read called The Mothers of Resistance, which basically shows specifically how white women in the United States, um, you know, organized against um, or I should say organized for like the segregations of schools, like organized for keeping black and brown families out of certain communities. And they did this specifically with like bake sales, newsletters, like meetings, you know, in, in these lofty suburban homes, like really grassrootsy shit is how they pulled this off. And also through kind of like what Ruby was saying earlier in the talk, like in playing to this really kind of, um, white lady ni niceties, you know, the reason they were able to get away with meeting and also with a lot of their harmful rhetoric and in a lot of um, targeted like threats and of violence, you know, against black families specifically was because they were white women and the way that they said things, the way that they presented their racism, the way that they presented their violence was deemed non-threatening and it was deemed um, it flew under the radar because they were women. And I think that says a lot about how like white gender is performed. And specifically with white feminism, I see an overlap in that um, when Women's March 2017 happened in this country, I spent a lot of time on the Women's March Facebook page, just kind of watching and watching mm -hmm. conversations play out on the Facebook page between women across race, but also as like different things were posted on the Women's March Facebook page. And I have uh, cited in my book, basically an exchange where the official Women's March Facebook account, you know, they, they posted a, a very enduring and thoughtful quote about bell hooks that basically acknowledges a lot of things that we're talking about that you know, women have historically the capacity to really exploit each other across race and class. And it's only that when we realize those things together that we can come to some sort of unified goal. Um, as you can imagine, in 2017, on the Women's March Facebook page, this didn't play out very well. And I have a lot of responses that are cited there, and I analyze them. But specifically, one woman stood out to me in that she um, made a defense for herself where I'm paraphrasing, but she basically said, like, I don't really have to understand, you know, why black women are marching. I don't have to understand why Latinas are marching. I don't have to understand why trans women are marching. Um, but it's really important for us to be nice to each other. And I analyze that in my book in that I see that as directly inherited from white supremacy and that maintaining your white niceties um, basically um, is like equated equivocally with having structural understanding of oppression. <laughs> um, and, and they don't, you know, they don't cross cancel each other out. But I think for a lot of um, white feminists specifically, I think uh, that's considered sufficient, just being nice to other people and being cordial. And that is a white supremacist tactic. Ruby, do you have? Do you have thoughts? Uh, I'll, I'll, I think I was answered that perfectly. Okay. So I'll, I'll yeah. leave time for other questions. There's so many questions and a, and a lot of them overlap. Um, so I'm gonna just take the liberty of sort of summarizing some together, which is, you know, what are some hallmarks of a non-white feminist space? How do we identify when we're outside of that ideology? Um, and, you know, what, feminists and or feminist books have also inspired you and guided your work? Um, I would say in, in, in my book, um, one of the ways I wanted to structure it with my editor the way that I did is that I wanted to specifically explore other movements in uh, the United States and elsewhere to show white feminism's ideological weaknesses, mm -hmm. to show what other movements have done to control for these same factors. Uh, a pattern I noticed with a lot of uh, gender rights movements outside of white feminist ideology is that they are very concerned with the collective. Mm -hmm. So one woman getting one senior position does not mean anything other than one woman got a senior position. It's very pragmatic. Um, they're more concerned with the uh, collective lives and experiences of everybody. They're also more concerned with policy rather than individualized ascension within like mm -hmm. a corporation or a neighborhood or a company or you know a particular set of circumstances. Um, they're also, you know, across both groups from people of color, and I mean this down through like 
Black, Chicanas, Native, through queer groups, disabled, working class, immigrant, they're all very skeptical of capitalism. And they're very upfront about that in the way that they present gender. And scrutiny of capitalism is baked into the way that they both interpret gender, but also interpret gender rights. And I make the point in my book that, you know, for a lot of these groups, this isn't like an intellectual pursuit. This is intuitive. Mm -hmm. They understand from a very corporal place that if you are operating from a lens of money, you will leave out a lot of people. And I think that um, one of the things that I make the case for in my book is that I think we have to be prepared for, you know, the feminist revolution, whatever that means to you or whatever you interpret that in being in your life or, you know, other people in your life. We have to be prepared for that to not be profitable. And we have to let that go mm. as like a benchmark of progress, either for one woman or a lot of other women. Oh, and, and you asked about a book, right? Yeah, that, or, or feminists in general who've inspired your work. Um, I spent a lot of time in my book on the bibliography <laughs> because I wanted to make sure that I was citing so many, you know, works that had inspired me and also that had informed my own study of white feminism. Um, it's really hard to pick one because they're all there and I put them there so that you would have them and so that you could access them on your own time and know these important works. Um, I would say uh, a really important collection um, that I love to read really outside uh, this work it, or outside of doing white feminism is um, This Bridge Called My Back, which I highly recommend if you have not read it. It is difficult to find because I'm not really sure if it's in print anymore. We have a vintage edition in our house, but um, it's very, very beautiful. It's it's prose and you know a little bit of essays and poems, and it's really like this hybrid genre. It's beautiful. Mm. Ruby, yeah. how do we know when oh, yeah. we've left white feminism? <laughs> so I. Um... Uh, and I absolutely agree with 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 Coa is in that um, when you look at uh, non-white feminisms and there is very much a um, a collective um, you know ethos uh, and that doesn't there's there's there isn't so much this um, isolation of gender as the sole you know locus of of oppression because non-white women have always had to fight multiple um uh, you know, uh, uh oppressions at, at once and you know one thing i look at um in in my book is early 20th century middle eastern feminisms and so um you know egyptian feminisms especially there was quite a um there was collaboration between Western, you know, uh, feminism and and uh, Arab feminism, and that fell apart when European feminists refused to condemn um, or speak out against imperialism in the Middle East, and Egyptian feminists couldn't understand it. They were why, well, like we're women and we're experiencing this and. You know, there's in, there's uh, invasions and threats to invade and, and you know sort of divvy up our, our countries among Western powers. Why aren't our sisters supposedly in Europe speaking out? And not, what they found is not only were they not speaking out, they were actually, um, you know, not just uh, condoning but advocating for it. So again, using leveraging their status as white women, European women. Um, and exploiting or really like throwing Arab women under the bus in order to sort of gain status in the West. And so that's the point where Egyptian feminists sort of stopped working with European feminists turned and turned to African feminisms because, and because anti-imperialism was such a primary focus for them. Um, so that's, you know, I think that's the biggest difference is that Yes, feminism's in the title, but but just recognizing that we can't vote, uh, vote, we can't fight for gender alone, and it's not enough to then say, well, we'll be intersectional and we'll have, you know, it's not just a recognition that other women and other genders exist. It's it's really um, it's it's a it, it's making that effort every day to really infuse that 
into the ideology and into the practice that um, you can't just look at gender because if you're only looking at gender as the oppression, then of course you're going to be focused on white middle class women because they really don't have, you know, all these other problems and, and, and these oppressions that, that they have to fight. So um, that, that to me is, you know, the, the, the biggest hallmark is that, that, that collective ethos. But um, uh, in terms of, 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 of a, a book, you know, I'm the same. I, I hate to just pick one. But what I will actually um, recommend to people, because this is easy, you can find it on the internet, is to look up the speech that Francis Ellen Watkins Harper gave to the 1866 National Women's Convention. Um, and I won't say too much about it, but it's called We Are All Bundled Up in This in One Humanity. And it's, just, it's a beautiful speech, which, which is about the need to recognise how uh, you can be victimised in one, one context and victimise others in another. And until um, you recognise that and recognise your part in, in that, then we're, we're, we're never going to have, like, you know, a, a just society because we are always going to be, you know, trampling on each other. So, um, yeah, I, I can't recommend it enough. It's a short speech and it's, it's beautiful. It's powerful and it, it blows me away that a black woman stood in 1866 before white women had the vote and just really just gave it, gave it really straight to, to suffragettes. I spent some time this summer with that speech while we were in sort of, well, it was a, a little muted recognition of the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, but that felt like a good time to go back to, to, to it. And I think the refrain she goes back to is we're all bound up together. Bound yeah. Up. Um, I, so I think it's fair to say, and I'm terrible at these like Jerry Springer like closing thoughts, but I'll just say this and, and thank mm -hmm. you both. Um, and I'll thank you again after I say this, you know, you know what white feminism is, or you know when you're not doing white feminism, not based on who is doing it, but what the work is and the questions it's asking and the way that it fights. You can't judge just by looking around the room and seeing who's here and who's not here. The questions will be different. The analysis will be different and the willingness to actually struggle together will be different. Um, I think it's time to sort of like bring the analysis and the structure for women struggling with one another that I find so lively outside of white feminism to bring this into white feminism, to learn how to fight. I think this is the time and this is what it's gonna take. Um, with that, um, please everyone buy Koa's book. There are links to it in the chat. Also please buy Ruby's book. They are um, just, just wonderful to read against and with one another. And I think we just need more work like this. So thank you both. Thanks for taking the time to um, to share your work with all of us. And thank you, Politics and Prose. I wish we were there with you in person. Um, but thank you for hosting this. It's been, uh, it's been a real pleasure to have this conversation. And yes, thank you. Thank you so much to Melissa for taking time out of this. Thank you so much to Ruby for coming all the way from Australia, Morgan, <laughs> Beth, Politics and Prose. I didn't want to say this, um, or I did want to say this at the beginning, but I have a very special fondness for politics and prose because my wife worked there in her early 20s. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so it's a very special place to both of us. <laughs> That's great. Um, and on the behalf of politics and prose, we'd like to thank you all for uh, joining us tonight and speaking. Uh, we also like to thank our audience for joining us and we always appreciate the support. Uh, have a great evening.